On November 4th, 1687, at 10 in the evening, a woman at last succumbed to the illnesses ravaging her body. She had been bedbound for months following two debilitating strokes. She was survived by one son and a small fortune. She was also survived by her wit, her talent, and an unexpected but seemingly innate kindness towards the less fortunate. She was a king's mistress, a duke's mother, and a renowned actress. But before all that, she was Nell Gwynn. Let's talk about the Restoration Cinderella. Eleanor Gwynn was born in either 1642 or 1650, depending on who you ask. Both dates are supported by historians, though only the former with documentation. However, most accounts use the 1650 date as a reference for her age during the many activities of her life, and so shall I. So, Eleanor Gwynn was born on February 3, 1650, in Hereford, London, or Oxford, England, also depending on who you ask. All three cities lay claim to her, but London seems to be the most popular choice, as it was the birthplace of her mother. Specifically, she was supposedly born in Coalyard Alley, a wretched little place in the district of Covent Garden. So, Eleanor Gwynne was born on February 3, 1650, in London, England. Her father was likely a man named Thomas Gwynne, a soldier of the Welsh military, while her mother, Helen, or Old Ma Gwynne, as she would be known, was lowborn, possibly fallen from a once respectable family. Nell Gwynne lived a very, depending on who you ask, kind of life. She was born and raised poor, without an education and never seeking one, so most of her life is told to us through anecdotes, satires, and historical bank accounts. She and her older sister, Rose, lived a hard childhood. When they were very young, their father was thrown into debtor's prison, where he would die, leaving a widow to feed two mouths by whatever means necessary. Helen, who was at this point a dedicated alcoholic, either opened her own brothel or worked at one a place where Nell spent much of her childhood. Nell and Rose might have even turned to prostitution themselves, though Samuel Pepys, a close friend of Nell's later in her life, said that she plainly denied this. Whatever the case, it wasn't prostitution that would set Nell in her path to stardom, but instead a semi-innocuous job working as an orange girl, a nickname for the girls who sold, you guessed it, oranges outside the theaters. Theaters, and other venues for the frivolous, had been banned under the rule of the Cromwells, but in 1660 the monarchy and its head, Charles II, were restored to the seat of power in England, and the king quickly threw his support behind the theater and dramatic arts. In 1662, he would legalize female actresses performing on stage, an act that many have conflated with Nell Gwynne's presence in his life, but no, the man was just seriously passionate about the stage. He established two acting companies in the first years of his reign. One of them, the King's Company, would open up the theater in Bridges Street, which would come to be known as the Theater Royal. It was at this theater that little Nell Gwynne worked, hawking oranges and sweets to attendees, when she struck up an acquaintance and eventual romance with one of the leading men in the cast, Charles Hart. Her close association with Hart, as well as her own bright, vivacious nature and quick wit, caught the eye of Thomas Kilgrew, the leader of the company. Kilgrew reportedly placed her in one of his performing classes straight away, and Nell took it upon herself to learn dancing. Within a year of her hiring as an orange girl, Nell Gwynne was ready to debut as one of the first actresses of the English stage. Her roles were small at first, as would be expected. Nell was pretty and charismatic, but getting recognition as an actor was hard harder still for the newly emergent women. Her first role might have been in 1664 as a side character in the play The Siege of Urban, but the billing is ambiguous enough that it could have been another woman entirely. 1665 was really her start. She kicked off the year by performing in her first official role as Montezuma's daughter in The Indian Emperor. Her performance did not impress diarist Samuel Pepys, who said that Nell wasn't a very good tragic heroine, an opinion she herself agreed with. But her next role would earn her not only Pepys' praise, but London's as well. Starring alongside her lover Charles Hart, Nell would solidify her place as one of England's preeminent comedic actresses with her rendition of her half of The Gay Couple, which is less what it sounds like to modern ears and more like a romantic archetype of the Restoration period. 
Their first play doing this particular routine was The Mad Couple, performed in 1665, and it was then that Pepys dubbed her Pretty Witty Nell, a phrase that has stuck to this day when describing Nell Gwynn. Nell and Charles Hart would return to these roles in a variety of different plays throughout the years. He the antagonistic cad, she the willingly unwilling and catty object of his affections. The archetype would become incredibly popular in the subsequent years, a legacy that some attribute to Nell Gwynn's captivating performances. Nell would go on to star in such plays as The English Monsieur from James Howard, The Chances from George Valiers, and the wildly successful Secret Love, or The Maiden Queen. That last role was one of her most famous. It involved her wandering around disguised as a man, possibly the first time this was done on the stage since women were invited on it. But Nell was no stranger to pretending to be a man. She had been doing so for years, adopting the persona William Nell and even going so far as to wear a fake beard. The experience as William must have informed her character enormously, as she was so good in the role that when she left acting, the play would not be restaged for another ten years. The play itself was popular enough to be dubbed his play by King Charles himself, and at this point we can be sure that Nell was on the king's radar, as an actress of supreme talent if nothing else. The year was now 1667. At this point in time, Nell had taken up with another Charles, this time Charles Sackville, the Lord Bruckhurst. Bruckhurst was charming, funny, and most importantly, loaded. He gave Nell an allowance of £100 and a house so she would leave acting to be his full-time mistress, which she did for a time, but the affair didn't last. Bruckhurst effectively dumped Nell, and the spurned Charles Hart wouldn't have her back. Nell returned to acting, but she was now broke. Enter an unexpected angel, the Duke of Buckingham, George Valiers. The Duke was, to put it lightly, not a fan of the King's current mistress, Barbara Palmer, and was looking to replace her. He offered the position to Nell, who said, okay, sure, just pay me 500 pounds. The Duke chose to instead offer the position to Nell's acting rival, the presumably cheaper Maul Davis. What happened next is urban legend, but an urban legend that would fit the trend of Nell's life. Overcoming other women, aka other obstacles, to the King's affections by any means necessary, however underhanded. In Maul Davis's case, Nell reportedly spiked her food with laxatives before Maul was meant to meet the king, thus ruining her good first impression. By 1668, the stage was set, so to speak, for Nell's introduction to the king. According to gossip, the two first properly met viewing a play, their boxes right next to each other. Charles was more interested in flirting with pretty, witty Nell than paying attention to the play, but imagine his horror when at the end of the performance he found himself unable to pay. Nell stepped in, covering the bill and teasing Charles, calling him, quote, the poorest company I've ever been in. The spark ignited, and she and the king launched into a full-blown affair. The affair wasn't secret, nor do I imagine it was unexpected to most who knew Charles. He was married to Catherine of Braganza, who was tragically unable to carry any of their children to term, and their marriage was fairly cold. His affairs were frequent, and they were numerous. Most likely expected Nell to be one in a long line of many, perhaps even Nell herself, since she continued to act well into 1668. The crowds her new infamy drew and the attention it gave her from playwrights likely kept her on as well. However, the entanglement continued, and her appearances decreased, until, by the end of 1669, Nell Gwynn had retired from acting to devote herself full-time to Charles and his court, as well as to her pregnancy with the couple's first son who would be born in May of 1670. If you're wondering, Nell had no shame in what she was or what she was doing. It wasn't in her nature. In addition to his delightful, pretty, witty Nell, Samuel Pepys also confessed that she was a bold, merry slut. A famous apocryphal moment has her scolding her servants for getting in brawls over someone calling her a whore. I am a whore, she said. Find something else to fight about. To be fair, there wasn't much to be ashamed about. Mistresses in that time had semi-official standing in the court, were well-paid, Nell herself bringing in almost £9,000 a year, and she had no immediate rivals. Nell even felt comfortable enough, and career-wise was in demand enough, to briefly return to the stage in 1670 for the two-part epic The Conquest of Granada. It was to be her last play, though. At age 21, or 29, depending on who you ask, Nell Gwynn was a full-time mistress. 
just in time as well, because that position was about to become much more precarious. 1670 saw the arrival of Louise de Carouai, a French woman who filled in as a replacement for her recently deceased friend as lady-in-waiting to Queen Catherine. She also might have been sent by French and English co-conspirators as a noble, appropriate, Catholic enticement to the king to sway him away from his current interest, namely, Nell. Nell herself was fiercely Protestant and could hardly speak a sentence without swearing, so the two women could not have been more different. Theirs would be a rivalry that would last for years, Nell having no great fondness for de Carouai's uppity manners, and de Carouai equally pricked by Nell's uncouth nature and degrading nicknames for her. My favorite of these being a toss-up between Cartwheel, a play on her last name, and Squintabella, which is just delightfully mean. Supposedly, de Carouai once wore black in mourning for the recently deceased Prince of France, even though she likely had never even met him. To mock her, Nell wore black the next day to quote-unquote mourn the cham of Tartary, quipping that if de Carouai could mourn for the clout, so could she. She even reportedly got her son an earldom out of jealousy for the royal title Louise's son had been given. The story goes one of two ways. First, that when Charles II came to call on his son, Nell addressed the boy as that bastard, to his father's horror. When the king asked why she would do that, she tartly informed Charles that since he had not seen fit to title the boy, it was only right, and Charles had to correct the problem if he took issue with it. A darker version of the story says that Nell hung her son out of a window until Charles gave him a title right there on the spot. However they got there, her son would become Charles, Earl of Burford. Nell and little Charles would move into a townhouse on Pall Mall in 1671, bought and paid for on the king's dime. It was one in a long list of king and mistress's ostentatious displays of affection to each other. Nell, for example, posed for several topless portraits, while Charles gave her a bed frame that was entirely made of silver. She called the king her Charles III, as he was the third Charles she had an affair with, but Nell was not interested in moving on to a fourth. She was, and would remain, unfailingly loyal to him for the rest of their lives together. When a suitor tried to dissuade her of those loyalties, she scoffed that she would not let a dog lay where a deer had. The couple had a second son in 1671, named James. Life went on quite happily for Nell for the next several years. She loved her boys and the king, and she enjoyed popularity amongst the English population. Once, when her carriage was stopped by an angry crowd who had mistaken it for that of the Catholic mistress de Carouai, Gwyn flipped back the curtain and informed the crowd, Good people, you are mistaken. I am the Protestant whore. The crowd applauded her, and she was free to pass. In 1676, her son Charles, and later James, were titled, and the king made Nell the owner of the house on Pall Mall. He also bought her and the new earl another house on the edge of the Windsor Castle complex so they could be close when he was in residence, as well as a summer house that she frequently entertained him at. It was, for Nell, probably one of the happiest years of her life, if not one of the most satisfying. However, the high was not to last. The next year, she sent her younger son James away to France for schooling, where he would remain until his death at only age 10 in 1681. The loss devastated Nell, who first accused Louise de Carouai of poisoning him, and then later blamed herself for sending her son so far away where she felt that no one could have properly taken care of him. Two years before James's death, Nell had lost her mother as well. She had tried to help the alcoholic back onto her feet for years, financing her and even housing her, but ultimately all her efforts failed. One fine day in 1679, old Ma Gwyn got drunk for the last time, fell into a lake, and drowned. Even grief-stricken, Nell was as acerbic as ever, and bade everyone at her mother's funeral send Helen Gwynne off with a glass of whiskey. Her sense of humor might have been intact, but it was a hard time for Nell, newly orphaned and now grieving a child. She shut herself away for months, but did eventually re-emerge and return to society. In 1684, Nell saw her remaining son, Charles, rise to the station of Duke and be given royal office positions, which are, in general, effectively useless, but they provide an income. And symbolically, the positions meant that Charles II wanted to see and let it be seen that their son was trusted and cared for. It was the last great flash of light for such a dazzling pair. One year later, on February 6th, 
1685. Charles II passed away after an apoplectic fit had sapped him of his strength. Some of his last words? Begging his brother, the future King James, to quote, not let poor Nelly starve. There's not much written about the last two years of Nell Gwynne's life. Her lover was gone, her son grown, her career long faded. She was also very likely suffering from an advanced case of syphilis she had picked up from Charles II. Nell collected her pension and retreated to her house at Pall Mall. In March of 1687, she suffered a stroke that left her half-paralyzed, and a few short months later suffered another that left her bedridden. She died of apoplexy on November 14, 1687. She was, depending on who you ask, 37 years old. She had outlived a father, a mother, a lover, and a son, but she was survived by Charles, Duke of St. Albans, whose line remains unbroken to this day. She left most of her estate to her son, but requested that 100 pounds be distributed to the poor at the time of her death, and 50 pounds be used every Christmas to release prisoners from the debtor's prison. Her funeral was fit for a queen and attracted large crowds before she was laid to rest at the Church of St. Martin of the Fields in London. In 1938, over 250 years after her death, London erected its first and only monument to an English official mistress at the Nell Gwynne House in Chelsea, depicting a standing Nell with a cocker spaniel at her feet. There was something both practical and sympathetic to Nell's personality, which is likely why she would go on to enjoy a near-mythic folk heroine status among the English populace after her death. She never forgot her family or her friends going so far as to persuade Charles II to give her sister Rose an income after Rose had been caught stealing, and speaking up on Samuel Pepys's behalf when he was accused of treason in 1679. It was not unheard of for her to persuade her new rich friends to go see the plays of her old friends she had left behind. She also was so moved by the plight of a homeless veteran she met on the streets that she bade the king start a hospital for them, making her at least partly responsible for the opening of the Chelsea Hospital in 1682. She was coarse, sometimes crude. She couldn't read or write, she was horrible at math, and was prone to gambling too much. But she was also a marvelous hostess with a divine wit who was blessed with the ability to maintain friendships at every class level. She didn't put on airs, never showed shame in anything she chose to do, no matter what it was, but she also strove for more than what she had. She was sort of like Cinderella, if Cinderella swore like a sailor and lost epic sums of money instead of shoes. Many stories about her are just that. Stories. But there was something about Nell that made people want to attach those stories to her. Pretty, witty Nell, the proto-hooker with the heart of gold. She of the rags who got the riches from the richest and got one over on that snobby French woman to boot. Wouldn't you want to write that story too? Well, Nell Gwynne couldn't write. So, she acted it out instead. (laughs) 